Today, I'm going to speak about the history of Harlem. It's a section of New York with many ties to organized crime. Having said that, I'm not going to mention every single person that came out of that neighborhood, because honestly, there's too many of them. The following information comes from articles, books, online information, which is not always accurate, the United States Census, interviews, and a great deal of research. Okay, without further ado, welcome to Harlem. Harlem is a neighborhood located in the uptown section of New York City. It's divided in three sections, West, Central, and East Harlem. And at one time, East Harlem was known as Italian Harlem, especially the six-block stretch spanning from 114th to 120th Street. That area, which approximately covered 7,200 square feet, became infamous in organized crime history. The first wave of Italians traveling from Italy to arrive in Harlem was in 1878. And tens of thousands of Italians, in their effort to escape Italy's poverty, followed in their footsteps. And they brought with them the trades and skills that they learned in Italy, which they hoped they could put in use in America to earn a living. However, by the turn of the century, Italian immigrants were considered among the lowest paid workers in the United States. By the 1920s, over 100,000 immigrated Italians were now living in Harlem. At one time, it had the largest Italian population in the country. Supposedly, it was the first area referred to as Little Italy, even before Mulberry Street. According to a 1930 census, Harlem's Italian population was three times more than the Lower East Side's Little Italy. Italians made their new homes in Harlem's tenements, most of which lacked the luxury of a bathroom or toilets. As a result, they had to share community ones. Nevertheless, the majority of the immigrants were hardworking and determined to make it here. In the early 1900s, East 108th Street in Harlem was the location of the murder stable, a place where many murders took place. The local Napolitan gangs went to war in this same area. As a matter of fact, Joe Valachi, who lived near the stable, spoke about the area's reputation. I couldn't get a decent job as the murder stable was constantly in the newspapers at the time. Always someone getting killed. The question would be, where do you live? Well, I would say 312 East 108th Street. They would snap back and say, no, we don't need any more. Guys like Lupo the Wolf, Giuseppe Morello, and his half-brothers, the Taranovas, stayed in this area as well. And over time, they became known as the Black Hand, or the extortion letters they sent, imprinted with a black handprint in place of a signature. Morello and his half-brothers would form the original 116th Street Gang, which would later become the 116th Street Crew, that I'll speak about shortly. In the 1920s and 30s, Harlem had a gang leader called Joe the Boss Masseria, who ran a mob that years later would go on to become known as the Genovese family. Tommy Lucchese, who would have one of the five families named after him, immigrated to America, specifically East Harlem, in 1911. Early on, he would be on the Gaetano Riina, who ran the family before him. Riina was originally with Morello, but broke off and formed his own family. During the war for power between Mazzari and Maranzano, Riina supported Maranzano. Riina, Lucchese, and Tommy Gagliano formed their own gang called the 107th Street Gang. And the three of them would become the founding members of a crime family that would be known as the Lucchese family. Another well-known member of their gang was Lucky Luciano. Although he lived on 110th Street on the Low East Side. And for the most part, the 107th Street Gang operated out of both Harlem and the Bronx. East Harlem was called home to a number of people like Frank Costello, who immigrated from Calabria, Italy in 1895. Former 107th Street gang member and future Lucchese boss, Tony Dux Corallo, grew up in East Harlem as well, as did his predecessor, Carmine Tremonti, who was raised on the same street as Corallo. And as a bonus to viewers, Johnny Cyburns was also a Harlem native. Pleasant Avenue is a large street that runs north and south in East Harlem. And one of organized crime's most notorious members, the Genovese front boss, Fat Tony Salerno, was born and raised there. He had his Palmer Boy Social Club on 115th Street in Pleasant, where he ran such rackets as gambling, number spots, loading dice games, loan sharking, etc. Fat Tony also headed the old 116th Street gang, now called the 116th Street Crew, but to some people who will refer to them as the Uptown Crew. Coincidentally, West Side boss Barney Belomo, who was also a member of the 116th Street Crew, was reportedly inducted into the family above an East Harlem pizzeria. 
on Pleasant Avenue, double and triple parked new cars would be seen parked outside social clubs. And some of them were left running, but none of the cars were ever broken into. The car owners were never concerned about being ticketed because the police were all on the take. There was nothing spectacular about Pleasant Avenue, but it was known as an area where millions of dollars in drugs and money were exchanged daily. Where other neighborhoods in New York might be visited for their good bakeries or restaurants, Pleasant Avenue, conversely, was the place to visit to borrow 50 or 100,000 if you knew the right people, or if your business was narcotics, to pick up as many kilos of heroin as you could afford. Harlem as a whole was extremely mob influenced. And to be more specific, a large percentage of men living in the neighborhood became members of various families. It's been said, the younger kids living on Pleasant Avenue didn't idolize Mickey Mantle like most young kids. If you ask them, they tell you their idol was Fat Tony, who coincidentally was not a fan of the drug business, a rarity for a person born and raised in East Harlem. The neighborhood's young Italian teens would dress like the older guys. But this wasn't only the case for the Italians, as the young black kids in Harlem were emulating black gangsters as well. Harlem's wise guys and street guys alike were heavily into the junk business. They'd rent apartments in the tenements where they would cut and bag the heroin. According to sources, it was no secret. Even the little kids in the neighborhood could direct you to a local pusher or the apartments where the cutting was going on. And this wasn't specific to one or two blocks. This was going on in the entire neighborhood. And for the unfortunate people with habits, they felt like they were in paradise. At this time, Harlem's, the Ascension Presbyterian Church, grew tired of watching the drugs ruin endless lives and took a stand against the narcotic dealing and the very people who were flooding their community with it. The tip of the iceberg came after the church discovered that at least 50 teenagers who once attended services had all died as a result of overdosing. The church reverend, Ralph Klingen, wanted to know what the police was doing to prevent any further deaths. He spoke to the public relations officer at the 23rd precinct regarding known drug spots in the neighborhood. The officer told him, we know where they are, the places you're talking about. We just can't get anything on them. The reverend questioned him, well, isn't it true that anyone who comes and turns them in, somehow the wrong side gets a hold of the name? Isn't that the reason a lot of people are afraid to come in and tell you exactly what's going on so that you could get the dope on them? The officer said, I'm not going to comment on that. However, in a later private conversation and off the record, he told the reverend, sure, yeah, this happens. We got a couple of bad cops who will report to the mafia so they can be taken care of. This time frame coincides with the investigation by the Knapp Commission into cops who were on the pad. Back then, cops were making between $200 and $400 a week to look the other way. But 1971, that extra money on top of a paycheck went a long way. One of those crooked cops, who later became a witness for the Knapp Commission, was with us in Fishkill. His name was William Phillips, who everyone called Bill. At the time, being he was a former cop and a cooperator, I didn't care for him. He would tell everyone how they used to pull junk pushers over in Harlem just to shake them down. If they or their cars were clean, they would throw a package of drugs in the car in the search and tell them it would cost them $5,000 to make the drugs disappear. According to Phillips, he said everyone always paid. Reverend Klingen, realizing the police would be of no help, linked up with fellow Reverend Norman Eddy and 20 other pastors and priests who all belonged to the East Harlem Interfaith Group, and they formed what was called the Drug Action Committee. The group of clergymen organized street demonstrations, prayer vigils, sang hymns, and even gave out communion in front of the buildings that held apartments where the drugs were being cut. These demonstrations eventually caught the attention of a young reporter for ABC's Channel 7 named Geraldo Rivera who wanted to do a film segment on what was going on in Harlem. Neither Reverend Klingen nor Eddie wanted to be interviewed. So instead, they had an assistant Catholic priest named Phil do the interview. The segment was called Drug Crisis in East Harlem. During the taping, Arado Rivera stated, There are approximately 125,000 heroin addicts in the city. Nobody, no matter where he lives, is safe from the heroin epidemic. Subsequently, the day after the story ran, a member of a crime family paid Father Phil a visit at the 116th Street Church. Later that night, all the stained glass windows at the church were broken. Shortly after, that same person visited Father Phil again and told him, we'll replace all your windows if you stay off this drug kick. But Father Phil refused his offer and told him, the church will replace the windows itself. News of this incident only strengthened the community's movement. 
Reverend Wyatt T. Walker from the Canaan Baptist Church lent support by sponsoring a rally. His congregation marched from 116th Street, where his church was located, to 106th Street. Over 3,000 people showed up that day. Reverend Walker told the protesters, let us know the minute you find out the name of a pusher. We've been living dangerously for a long time, and we're not afraid to name names. I am convinced that God is concerned about the narcotic peddlers on 116th Street. The day after the rally, two guys in a Cadillac pulled up to Reverend Walker's house. They told him, get your black ass out of town. They offered him the car, as well as a house in Westchester County that was paid for. And they also gave him a threat by telling him that they knew where his children attended school. The Reverend told them to leave and that he didn't want to see them anymore. He reported the incident to the Interfaith Committee and supposedly kept a low profile afterwards. The committee's battle against the sale of narcotics in Harlem turned out to be a losing one, as many more young lives were lost to drugs. As for the junk pushes, they were unaffected and continued business as usual. If a spot happened to get raided, another one would open up shop down the street. East Harlem has a yearly tradition that started in 1908, a feast that lists the Julio. Here's a picture of Genovese Captain Angelo Prisco, a Harlem native, whose duty it is to be in charge of all the lifts of the 82-foot-tall steeple, which is topped by St. Paulinus. East Harlem is also home to the iconic restaurant Rails, located on 114th Street in Pleasant. Four blocks over, on 118th Street, is where they filmed the scene from the movie The Godfather. In that particular scene, Sonny Corleone gives his brother-in-law Carlo a tune-up on the sidewalk. Even though there's a great deal of documented violence that took place in East Harlem, the neighborhood was safe to those who lived there. Doors were never locked, and residents had no use for the police. It was the wise guys who watched the neighborhood and dealt out any punishment. There was always merchandise being sold at a cheap price around the neighborhood, items that fell off the back of trucks. Allegedly, one summer, most of the guys in the neighborhood could all be seen wearing identical orange terry cloth shirts. People were known by their nicknames. As one former Harlem Knight explained, if you didn't have a nickname, no one knew who you were. And there were many. To name just a few, Rafi, Fat Gigi, Echoes, Ernie Boy, Charlie Chan, Skinny Frank, Monk, Buster, and the list goes on. For Harlem, the 1970s was historically the worst of times. The drug addiction rate was 10 times higher than the average rate of all New York City. The pushes were moving heavy weight, and they had it stashed all over the neighborhood. A local butcher, nicknamed accordingly Eddie the Butcher, had a shop on 119th Street that was rumored to be a front for certain pushes. And a running neighborhood joke was that Eddie the Butcher never even sold a pork chop in 40 years. A December 6, 1977, New York Times article titled, New York Gang Reported to Sell Death and Drugs, went on to say, a Manhattan gang whose members worked just a decade ago as teenage errand boys for major narcotic traffickers has now emerged as a new and violent force of its own in organized crime. The group, which calls itself the Purple Gang, after the band of criminals that terrorized Detroit during the Prohibition era, has been identified by law enforcement agencies as being involved in the following criminal activities. The murder, and in many cases, dismembering of 17 individuals with criminal backgrounds, including at least two police informers. Large-scale distribution of narcotics in the South Bronx and Harlem. Muscle jobs for two organized crime families, extortion networks, and international gun running. The article cites a DEA report dated December 1976, which referred to the Purple Gang's enormous capacity for violence and the lack of respect for other members of organized crime. Law enforcement believed the Purple Gang attempted to become the Region 6 family and how that could turn into a mob war. The report also stated how the younger group, impressed by the antics, violence, and wealth of the older traffickers, began to emulate them and after a while become uncontrollable. Amazingly, they were considered incorrigible by members of the mafia. At the Purple Gang's peak in the late 70s, their member count reached around 30 with 80 to 100 associates, according to law enforcement. But the numbers could be higher. The gang's leaders were Joey and Michael Meldish, and most of its members were related to members of the five families. To call them a farm team would be incorrect. These were a group of young guys that had wise guys scatter them. Harlem is one of the many areas in New York that was heavily influenced by organized crime and its members. But as with all things, over time, change takes place. And that East Harlem neighborhood that was once overflown with organized crime lost its wise guys and is now gentrified. And by the same token, what the mob was in its heyday is also long gone. Its remaining members just haven't got the memo yet. Mm -hmm.